Thank you so much. Thank you. That was awesome. That was amazing. So com speaking of completely ridiculous things, we're going to talk about some stuff here that isn't something that you're likely going to be doing at work, uh, but it may be something that you do to uh, pick up some skills that you could use at work or that you could use when you're thinking about something else. And so this talk, it, we're, we're going to be looking at historical software. We're going to be looking at software from decades ago, the early 90s, uh, late 80s, uh, looking at, at software for the Commodore Amiga, so the 16-bit system, uh, not as maybe popular here in the U.S. as it was in Europe for home use, uh, but uh, still a very interesting system, a very uh, unique system among retro systems, this being one of the first uh, systems where C was a first-class language one of the first systems where you had a multitasking operating system, one of the first systems where you had a TCP IP stack uh, that wasn't a PC, right? And so the idea with this is we're gonna be using vintage computing platforms as a playground, somewhere where we learn about vulnerability research, where we learn about exploiting things in an environment that's fun, uh, and that sort of tickles some of the interest that people have in retro computing in general, which I have. So there's a large interest right now in vintage and retro computing systems. Uh, there's tons of YouTube channels, there's lots of people on Twitter who collect hardware, who look at software, uh, who are dedicated to either preserving this stuff, uh, restoring things, we're always, we're always, you know, talking about clipping out the, the bad batteries and cleaning up the acid leaks that those batteries do to the motherboards, uh, collecting versions of software that have previously thought to have been lost, uh, looking at documentation and making sure that, that people can remember this because there's a large body, a huge body of software written in the 80s and 90s that's not in current active use, but somebody wrote it. Somebody spent months or years of their life putting that code together, and it's interesting to look at that. It's interesting to see what, where their time and their efforts went and, because that stuff is what, uh, what modern software is built on top of. Even if it's not straight from the source code, it's the stuff that we used before we started writing our software. And so there's an overlap of interest with hackers with this. There's lots of, of hackers in the InfoSec community that are also in the retro industry. Uh, and even if you are on a shoestring budget and you can't like pay the, the skyrocketing eBay prices for this sort of equipment, uh, you can build a nice collection and a nice environment for doing research in this area uh, in just a few gigabytes of space. So with off of archive.org, you can grab all the old documentation you want, all the old documentation you read. I love reading old computer books, right? Uh, that's basically what I use my iPad for, just downloading tons of PDFs from archive.org of old programming manuals and computer science textbooks and technical manuals and such. Uh, there's archives of all of the preserved free and, and commercial software for these things, things that have been abandoned. Uh, and so a combination of documentation and disk images for all the software you can, for, for example, for the Commodore Amiga that we're looking for, you can have a complete set of everything there ever was for it, essentially, on a, on a thumb drive. Uh, and for me, that's fascinating. So I grew up using a Commodore 64, the 8-bit system that came before the Amiga. And, uh, you know, I had a large collection of floppy disks acquired from various sources, uh, BBSs and copies and things like that. So I probably had a few hundred disks and everything growing up that I just loved just going through and seeing what was there and exploring. And now you can go back and do that and have that sort of nostalgia hit if you, that's your thing, right? I, and, and just explore old disk images and see what you can find and see, see that work that people put into things. Uh, you can set up emulated environments and things that had hardware that you couldn't afford back then. It was very expensive to buy hard drives for these things. It was very expensive to buy uh, 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 you know, memory expansions and things like that. But in an emulated environment, it's all free. You just sort of click the button and add it in. Uh, there's lots of modern hardware add-ons that we're going to talk about for this particular platform. And so the question is, is all this is nice for nostalgia. We can, 
leverage these archives and these efforts to create these environments that make it easy and fun uh, to just tinker around with this stuff, but we can also use it to teach, right? And so in a modern uh, computing environment in like a 64-bit Intel system, uh, there are so many exploit mitigations in place. You know, we started with smashing the stack in the mid '90s, and uh, the the we we've solved not solved, but we made it harder to exploit that by having non-executable stacks and stack cookies and address based layout randomization and all sorts of various things that make it harder and harder to write exploits. But the problem with that, it's very difficult to just turn on a 64-bit Intel system and start learning how to write exploits or start learning how to reverse engineer programs when all that stuff's in the way. And so you'll see that most tutorials have uh, some mechanism for turning those off on modern operating systems. It's a lot of steps and it's, it creates an environment that's okay to, to, to tinker around with, but maybe it's not the most uh, authentic environment, right? Whereas if we look at it, something like the Commodore Amiga and code for it, you know, what we were looking at is a lot of code that was written in C using TCP IP networking, uh, but predates the publication of Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit in FRAC uh, by over a year. Like, uh, so tons of code uh, written before really most people had a concept of what it meant to uh, to to uh, try to defend against these. You know, back then we knew, you know, if we have a, a variable in memory that we're, we're trying to uh, stuff data into, we knew that C wouldn't keep us from writing over the end of it, and we knew it would crash if we did that. And, but, you know, maybe not everybody had put together the consequences of that in a networked environment where anybody can stuff that, that buffer for you. And so really, and another thing that was interesting for me, uh, I started giving presentations at DEF CON, uh, at DEF CON 19, that was the first time I gave a talk, and I've given several since. Uh, and, you know, I've presented research that I've done at universities and things like that. A lot of the research I do now is under NDA. Uh, a lot of the stuff is stuff that I wish I could tell you about, and maybe one day I hope I can, uh, but, but I can't right now. But, this is something that's fun. It's fun for hacking's sake, and I think it's something that you can learn from, and it's not covered by a non-disclosure agreement. The potential benefits of this, if you're going to be getting into this sort of stuff, like looking at old software with a view for vulnerability research, uh, it's, a, it's an environment for exploring the insides of software that belongs to computing history. Uh, you've got a comprehensive availability of emulation, documentation, preserved software archives, you can have a wholly self-contained environment for doing this research in a very small amount of space and with very easy to use tools. Most of the, most of the emulators that for all these old systems have pretty nice debuggers built into them because the emulation developers need those debuggers to make sure that the code of the operating system and software running on top of it is actually something uh, that's being executed authentically. And so they need good debuggers, and so there's usually a good debugger in there. And WinUAE, which is what we're going to be using for Amiga stuff in this talk, is something that has a very nice debugger built into it. And so emulating software that predates modern awareness of security vulnerabilities and mitigations, it gives students of offensive security research, people who want to learn how to break things, how to hack things. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, you don't have to go blue team. You can, you can enjoy being a red teamer, right? Uh, it gives you an environment where there's no active measures to bypass, so you can just sort of step through the easy mode version of it and build that confidence in your tooling, build that confidence in reading assembly and reading different architectures of assembly and uh, examining memory and sort of understanding the environment uh, from a basic point of view before you start looking at more modern software, more modern environments. There is a very high yield of zero-day findings for your effort. So if you want to find bugs that nobody else has found before as a beginner, you're going to have a hard time of it with modern software because that's a, there's a lot of people uh, looking at a lot of popular modern software and they find the bugs before you're going to. And even if you find a bug, it's going to be very difficult to exploit. Whereas uh, it's, it's for, for a lack of a better term, it's like shooting fish in a barrel with this software. Right? because it's written before that awareness for security is there. It's not the fault of the programmers of this software because they didn't, 
they had no resources to do any better, and it worked, right? It was amazing that it worked out at all back then. And also, if we start talking about the ethics of vulnerability research, uh, you can completely sidestep that with this, right? So nobody's going to get mad at you for breaking their FTP client that they released in 1993. I actually tried to find the author of the one that we're going to look at here, and I, I couldn't locate him. I couldn't get in touch with him. And I, I, I hope he's doing well, and I hope he doesn't mind. But uh, there's very little chance of like an organization sending you a cease and desist o over this, right? And also, legacy systems are still in operation. How many Motorola 68Ks do you think are still running? A lot, I bet. And so, if it's the thing, the sort of things that a Motorola 68K is sitting in is the sort of thing that if it's still run, if it as long as it kept running, as long as it kept turning over clock cycles and doing its thing, chances are it's still there, right? So there's a lot of printers that use Motorola 68Ks, and you know if it's a laser jet printer or something like that, then uh, as long as you can get toner refills for it, they're probably just going to keep it in place. Uh, a lot of industrial controllers and PLCs use this same processor, and those for sure are a, are an environment where as long as it's working, we're not going to replace it. Uh, networking equipment. Uh, VME bus systems uh, that are used in all sorts of industrial and military situations. There are automotive systems, there are cars that have Motorola 68Ks in them. And the Motorola 68K processor went on to evolve into a more, uh, into some more modern systems. There were cold fire processors later on that, uh, that, that implemented more features and are maybe not binary compatible but uh, are still at heart Motorola 68Ks, and if you know a 68K, then you can do this. And there's many different versions of the 68K as well that have increasingly more sophisticated features and memory mapping and things like that. TI calculators, the 89, 92, 90, 89 plus range, all had 68K processors. Uh, a bunch of uh, uh, audio synthesizers have it. And, and then there's the microcontrollers that have synthesized cores of the Motorola. The Amiga is probably the best desktop computer platform for tinkering with the Motorola 68K, though. For the operating system and the body of software written for it, the accessibility of it, it's quite easy to get hold of 500, uh, the Amiga 500 models. Uh, it's Motorola 68K based, and you know you can expect to find anything from a 6820 to a 6860 in there if you've got a really nice one. Uh, the video output for it, PAL, NTSC, and then there's a s format for, for uh, a video for or Amigas where more sophisticated video cards could be used with them to output what they call RTG graphics. And that can be of arbitrary resolution and color depth. And so for a modern Amiga setup, you can literally have your 1920 by 1200 monitor filled up with an Amiga desktop. And it's a lot of fun to use one like that. Uh, the custom chipsets of the Amiga are what make an Amiga an Amiga. It's a bunch of custom ASICs, a bunch of custom chips that Commodore made that went along with the 68K that handled things like the audio, the floppy, the serial, video output, interfacing custom chips, and they all have their names, Paula, Denise, Lisa, Agnes. Uh, these are all parts of the hardware architecture of the Amiga that make the Amiga an Amiga. Uh, that's, these, thing, these chips are, are, are expensive on eBay now because that you can't just manufacture new ones. Uh, we're, we're working off of old, new old stock or old stock and things salvaged from other co computers. Uh, but there are some modern FPGA rec re recreations of these chipsets, and that's going to be something you want to look at as to a possibility for an environment if you want to create a hardware environment for this. The architecture for memory for the Amiga uh, involves having chip RAM and fast RAM. So chip RAM is shared with those other chips, the Paula, Denise, Lisa, Agnes, between the Motorola 68K and that. And you can expect to see about up to two megs of that memory shared between them. That's slower memory because it's on a memory bus where those chips can get access to that bus and keep keep this processor from grabbing stuff on that memory because they can kind of deal with memory directly and do their own thing. 
Uh, fast RAM is additional RAM on top of that two megabytes where the CPU has exclusive access to it, the, the custom chipsets can't, can't access it directly, and so the, the, while the custom chips can access that chip RAM, while it's waiting for access to that memory, the 68K can access that fast RAM and just sort of clock it as fast as it wants to. Uh, there are all-in-one models where the, the, the computer's in the keyboard like we would, like Americans would usually expect to see out of a Commodore 64. Uh, the 500, 500 pluses, 600s and 1200s. And then there's desktop models that in the U.S. you mostly saw for use in video production, video toaster, or doing broadcast video. That was one of the most popular applications in the U.S. for the Amiga. So in the U.S. you saw lots of desktop tower type Amiga or, or, or pizza box style Amigas being used in video production and in Europe you saw lots of the all-in-ones being used for gaming and general purpose computer use. And then they bear, what interests me the most about the, the Commodore Amiga being the, the uh, classic Amiga OS. When I say classic Amiga we're talking about these Motorola 60K 8K Amigas. After Commodore went out of business uh, there were many different directions for Amiga OS, and that's a rabbit hole I'm not going to go down. But for the Amiga hardware, there are PowerPC Amigas out there, and there's attempts to port the Amiga Core uh, operating system to Intel processors and recreations at the API level of them. Uh, but the classic Amiga OS that runs on the 68Ks is so interesting to me because it is a perfect little playground. There's no virtual memory, so you don't have to work, worry about, or it's optional. You usually don't have a virtual memory system on a classic Amiga. Uh, uh, most of the 68Ks don't have a memory mapper unit, and so there's no virtual memory. The address is the physical address on the chips, and all of the running programs share that memory space. All the running programs can screw around with each other's memory, which is you know, not the most stable thing in the world, but it sure is fun, right? Uh, it's fun when you're stepping through things in a debugger when you can sort of just go mess around with whatever you want to without having to worry about understanding page tables and things like that. It's not multi-user. It is a single-user operating system, but, uh, and, but it is multitasking. And so, and it's preemptive multitasking. It's the first desktop example of this. And what I mean by that is early operating systems that provided multitasking to home users like a Mac OS up to even the late 90s, up until uh, 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 Mac OS 10, was uh, cooperative multitasking. Your process had to give up the processor at some point so other processes could execute, right? You had to have a call in there saying, I'm done with what I want to do with my slice of time. Somebody else can have my time. Otherwise, you would just hang the whole system with your little program. Uh, the Amiga OS triggers interrupts on a regular basis and will take the state of a process and all of its registers, store it off, and then give another processor time, and then swap them back in, and it's all seamless, just like you would expect on a modern operating system. Uh, uh, and it, and it's, it's, very, it's very interesting being the first system doing this. It's well documented, uh, and what's not well documented about it, you know, that's the part that you get to have fun reverse engineering. Lots. And if you're a vulnerability researcher, there's lots of file formats, there's lots of parsers, there's lots of uh, interesting things. Uh, the, the, the sort of beginnings of our PNG graphics file format are there, like cooked into the, into the main modules of the Amiga OS with the IFF format. PNG is an evolution of that IFF image file format. Uh, interchangeable file format is, is what it stands for, but it's a lot of times used for images. Uh, another Juan Classic Amiga, there's lots of communication software. The Amiga came out and towards the end of its life was coming out in a time when the internet was starting to become something that normal users could have access to, that they could dial up into a service or have a networking connection in some way and talk TCP IP instead of just dialing up a BBS and having one point-to-point -point communication. Uh, and so we, we have that environment where a file handle might, be, might not be a file or user input from the console, it might be coming over a TCP IP stream from another computer, which has its, is where we're starting to have our security concerns. 
Uh, and if you just want to use it, you could almost use an Amiga OS right now as a daily driver with all the software that's out there. Or, or if you want to just go full hermit mode and, and, you know, desert island computer, you could have a lot of fun for the rest of your life just playing on a Commodore Amiga. Full HD display, RTG graphics. Uh, if you got some expensive hardware, you got accelerators, but right now you can get a, what's called a Pi Storm that allows you to replace the Motorola 68K with a board, with a, with a little uh, CPLD type thing, uh, and a, a, a Raspberry Pi, and it will emulate that 68K at clock speeds that are very fast, and it becomes a very smooth experience. There are network adapters, both old and new. The newer ones are a little bit easier to set up than the old ones. And it's a very responsive user interface. You're the only user, right? And so it's not trying to swap around. It's almost, it's almost real time, right? Something I also have been tinkering around with lately is the Apple IIe, uh, which is extremely fun to reverse engineer. It's less interesting on vulnerability analysis because it's such a different programming model to modern systems. But it's extremely fun to reverse engineer. So the Apple II ROMs, stepping through those and reverse engineering the 6502 assembly of those, the tricks that they use to, to, to get the monitor ROM in such a small amount of space, like the, the, the sort of the REPL that you use to, uh, to investigate memory and, and assemble new code in and execute it, it uh, they, they, they'll like reuse parts of functions and jump into the middle of functions. It's not, they're not functions in the classical sense as we think of as a like compiled C code. And so it's all hand assembled, and so you get to see what Wozniak was, was thinking when he wrote this stuff, and it's very interesting. Those Apple IIs are less connected, there's less interoperation in terms of file formats between software, so it's not quite what we need for this talk, but it might be something I'll talk about in the future. Exploitation for those is different, right? And so I've, I've written some Apple IIe exploits, but nothing, nothing terribly impressive yet. So the modern modifications, I've talked about the Pi Storm accelerators, very fast CPU. It also, since it's sitting as a CPU, it, it, it by default has access to the bus, so it can implement that, hey, also there's some storage here. Also there's RTG graphics. Also there's a ton of fast RAM. Also, instead of having to burn new operating system ROMs for different versions of operating systems, you can just have them on the Pi's file system and say, I want to run Kickstart 1.4 today. I want to run Kickstart 2 today. I want to run Kickstart 3 today. And all of those have different modules built in. You can, to do video adaptation to this, there's another, you can have another Raspberry Pi inside of your Commodore Amiga that will convert the RGB output to a very clean HDMI signal. You can adapt the keyboards and mice because, God bless them, Commodore never did make a good keyboard. Uh, and you can uh, have, have the network adapters for them. Uh, there are compact flash adapters to, to, uh, to add storage to them. Uh, and that's a first class citizen on, a, on the Commodore Amiga. The 1200s and the 600s had IDE buses on them to, to add drives. And so it's very easy to get storage onto them in a modern sense. And now there are FPGA recreations of the entire system. And so if the eBay prices do continue to go up, and I hope I don't contribute to that with this talk, uh, the, the mini MIG is a good uh, implementation of a base, level com a base level Commodore Amiga. Mr. FPGA uses the mini MIG core in that, and you get a bunch of other systems that you can emulate with it. And then Apollo makes uh, a series of standalone and accelerator FPGAs for Commodore Amigas. So if you want to set up a research environment for this, uh, you, can, you can test and play on real hardware and it's a lot of fun. I've, I've got a 500 plus that I've built up for tinkering with this sort of thing and I love it. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a refurbished 1200 motherboard on its way that I'm going to be putting in a plexiglass case. Uh, to have the real Cadillac of Commodore hardware. Uh, but that's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like uh, tinkering with an old car, right? Sometimes it's a little fussy, sometimes it's a little t difficult. And honestly, like with the real hardware, sometimes it can be hard to get that really low level debug access to it. Uh, when it's very easy to launch Win UAE as an emulator and and just fire and just break into the debugger, right? It's just like having a perfect in-circuit debugger. 
you have save states on, on the emulator, so you can sort of rewind state and replay back and do different things. Uh, you can copy and replace drive images very quickly so that you can change the state of the disk and swap out different configurations. Physically portable, like I can, I, I don't want to take my, I don't want to take any of my Commodore hardware with me anywhere. Like I don't, I don't trust it to travel well, so, so I'm going to use it on my laptop, right? Win UAE is extremely accurate. Uh, the, the U in UAE, the, the acronym originally was unusable Amiga emulator, uh, but it has evolved since then. It's, it's incredibly accurate now, especially with certain configurations. It's tricky to set up at first though, and I have a set of slides here that don't expect to read these slides and just be like, oh yeah, I know what that's saying. This, these slides are for when you watch this back on YouTube or you grab these slides so that you know what settings to set in WinUAE just to get started with a basic setup. Uh, you set up your CPU, you set up whether you want it to be cycle accurate speed, you set up whether you want a floating point unit, you set up whether you want to do just in time recompilation of assembly language instructions. You set up uh, what, which version of the Commodore or underlying chipset you want to use and whether you want its memory access to be cycle correct. You set up which ROM you want to use and this is one of the later Kickstart ROMs and, and uh, I think in a slide here in a moment we're going to talk about uh, what might surprise you about that. Um, you set up how much memory it has. You set up uh, what hard drives that you have for it. And if you, in this right here, some hardware, quote unquote, hardware that you're adding to your system with WinUAE, WinUAE is very clever and it implements it as, um, as in-memory uh, 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 hooks. It, like there's the BSD sockets library for connecting to the internet. The code for that is not in the Commodore Amiga's memory. There's, a, there's like a, a placeholder stub in there that gets called and when UAE sees that executing, grabs it, does its native host thing for networking and then pulls it back in there. The Amiga emulator actually shares your IP address and TCP stack. Then RTG graphics and such. The Kickstart ROM contains the OS, the libraries, the modules in ROM. Ideally, you want your Kickstart ROM to match the operating system that's on disk. Otherwise, there'll be multiple copies of each of those modules, and it'll and you'll waste a little bit of memory having that. For a 1200, most of them shipped with version 3.0 of Kickstart. The last Commodore version was 3.1 and 94. Hyperion is probably like like there's a lot of debate over who has Amiga OS and who is the true Amiga OS nowadays, and I'm not getting into that. But the latest Hyperion version that I think is the most authentic to the Commodore version is 3.2.2, and it was released in April of this year. So Hyperion continues to release patches and updates to the Amiga OS. Uh, later version numbers are either PowerPC or actually older. There are 68K versions of, of Commodore OS with later version numbers that are actually older than 3.2.2. You can install it from floppy disk images in WinUAE or make your own floppies to install it on a real Amiga. The Picasso 96 driver here from AmiNet, which is the archive for Amiga software, that's what you're going to do to get RTG graphics up. If you want a development environment, SAS C for your C compiler. Dev pack for your assembler. And this is if you want to do your stuff on system, which I don't even have an off system one on here. I like doing it in the system. I like have I like the I like the windowing interface for an Amiga. It's fun to use. I'm not I'm not playing with my Amiga stuff to play with a piece of software on Windows. I'm playing with it to play with in Amiga OS. But on the host, uh, there's servers and scripts that the VM uh, that you can interact with. Uh, Ghidra, the NSA disassembler reverse engineering decompilation tool, has a Motorola 68K module, great support for it, so that also tells you that if the NSA thinks that it's a good idea to have 68K support in a disassembler, maybe there's some relevant platforms out there that, <laughs> that, that you would want to take a look at with it. Um, you want that. Ghidra is a great, great for looking at memory images out of WinUAE. And you want a matching development kit for your Kickstart OS. The, ND, the NDK is like grabbing the Windows SDK. It has all the headers for all the operating system stuff. It tells you the names of all the functions, all the arguments, all the data structures. You can literally drag those header files into Ghidra and then start applying it to memory for modules and stuff. 
Books. I love old computer books. You can grab these on eBay. You can grab these on archive.org. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got both. I've got a shelf of 68K Amiga OS stuff, and, but I also have all the books on my iPads because I like to travel and read, and I don't like ta taking big books with me. The Amiga DOS manual is what you want to use to, like, figure out how the hell do I use this thing because it's a very different paradigm from Windows. Uh, you'll want the, the official, like, instruction set reference for the Motorola processor. And then the Commodore Amiga references for digging into just what it is that you're looking at, what, how's it architected, the hardware reference manual, the kernel reference manual, uh, uh, the, the libraries, devices. Uh, that includes an autodocs, that's probably better looked at in, in, as files on your NDK. This developer CD uh, on archive.org has a, a, a good recent NDK that matches the later Commodore ones, or you can download the NDKs from uh, Hyperion. Then the SASC development manuals, uh, uh, that it has its own debugger utilities, and so there's there's pretty nice in-system debugging too. But obviously, like you want like to do operating system level stuff, you want to get outside of that with WinUAE. There is a lot of resources for preserving uh, vintage computers, and so Toset catalogs known software and documentation for many different computing platforms, and so you can build yourself a complete set of Commodore or Amiga software from this. Archive.org has lots of books and software, and the English Amiga board, it's a fantastic set of folks that are talking 24 hours a day about Amiga stuff, arguing over which FPGA is better too. If we look at the architecture of the Amiga OS, this is straight from the manuals. The Amiga hardware is down here at the bottom with the chips, the actual Commodore chips that do disk control, keyboard and mouse, graphics, audio, and I.O. There is one library, one module that talks to those chips, and that's exec. That's essentially your very core kernel. This is almost, very almost a microkernel architecture. Uh, uh, and so exec does most of the work in talking to the hardware, and then other modules uh, handle everything else. The graphics rendering, the, the windowing system, DOS, audio, serial and parallel. And so when you're talking about porting Amiga OS things, all you have to really port is exec. And that has your tasks, which are your processes, your messaging system between processes, handling interrupts, inter IO, uh, loading libraries and such. When a library, if you're looking at a memory image for a Commodore Amiga, a library that's loaded into memory has a base address, but it's actually in the middle of a data structure. The library's metadata is ahead in memory of that library base. The data for the library is past that, but before the library base, minus from that base, is a jump table for all the functions of that library. And those are numbered, essentially. You can just do a simple multiplication to figure out, oh, it's function three. Well, I multiply three by a constant and, that ju and, and jump to that address, and that's a jump table to where that function actually exists in memory. And so that's how you find API calls, kind of uh, like what you would expect out of load library and get, pr get, uh, get, function, uh, uh, get function address type stuff in Windows. If we look at, uh, uh, this is a full memory map of the Commodore Amiga, and so most old systems, you have a memory map and you know, microcontroller systems and things like that. It would, it would, your, your memory map would have all sorts of addresses for static addresses that are important for the system, like how do you talk to the keyboard and things like that. On a Commodore Amiga, there is one address that is supposed to be always static, and that is hexadecimal four, and that's a pointer to sysbase. And from there, you're supposed to use the exec library to find everything else, right? And that's, that's, that's your bootstrap into getting there. Uh, now, in practice, a lot of this stuff is in static areas of memory. Uh, a lot of games talk to the hardware directly without using exec. And that's, of course, not supported, but of course, games are going to do it for performance's sake. The case study, this is the first time I'm revealing publicly the target software, <laughs> and uh, it's GUI FTP. It's just an FTP client, very simple FTP client. And I wanted to pick a target 
that was of the time, not a modern version of GUI FTP, not a modern piece of Amiga software, because there's plenty of it, right? There's people still writing software. And so what I did was I grabbed the very first CD published set of software from Aminet. And that's all not my archive.org. And it has early networking and file format software, and which is the sort of thing you want to look at for simple vulnerability analysis. It was published in January of 1995, again, considerably earlier than smashing the stack for fun and profit, which is sort of your moment in time where some people started becoming more aware of exploiting C software. And so you get this great like hypertext interface for it. So there's like a hypertext system kind of built into Amiga that a lot of software uses for navigating directories and documents and things like that. And so you can see that there's 86 whole megs of communication software on this Aminet set. And that's a lot of software when you're talking about software that old. And so everything on this disk predates smashing the stack by at least 14 months. This was literally the first one I picked. I was like, mm, an, FTP, an FTP client's probably fun because FTP's a little bit of a complicated protocol to parse. Uh, it's uh, by Kevin Priest, who did a fantastic job of it, and, and we cannot blame him at all for having buffer overflow vulnerabilities in place, especially, it's his first release. He's, he's not even sure if he's gonna keep the numbering scheme for version numbers. If he's out there, get in touch. And it's referred to in books, and so we can establish that this is a soft piece of software you would legitimately use back then. This is something that if you wanted to connect to an FTP server, you would have used this. We install it, so we install it from the ISOs. Again, very easy to do in WinUOE, just mount these ISOs and go. And running it, you see a very familiar two-pane interface for an FTP client, so this is you know, uh, what you'd expect to see. And it works with modern, like this is a, a very simple FTP server that I've set, or actually this, in this screenshot, I've just connected to ftp.gnu.org and it connects to it fine, it lists out directories, so it still works. If we wanna start exploiting this thing, we can look at a memory map and see where in memory the kickstart ROMs and things like that loaded. Uh, we wanna find where this is in memory. And so uh, just to have a, si a situational awareness, we can use, and all of this is in the WinUA debugger, we can dump memory to a set of bin files that we can then load into Ghidra one at a time and create a memory map of our Commodore in this situation with this software loaded that we can add, so we can navigate in Ghidra uh, the internals of this thing. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to take headers for say the BSD socket library or any other library in the data structures and start creating uh, things that we can refer to to navigate around memory in Ghidra. So what part of GUI FTP are we gonna attack? Uh, a large server, a lot of things crash this thing, but large server welcome messages crash, it's not reliable, I couldn't get it to, to do the same thing twice in a row but long file names and file lists crash it really reliably. Like if you give it too long of a file name, it'll crash in the same way every time so we can develop a well-structured payload. I decided it's been a while since I did anything with, with, uh, with, with uh, FTP, so I looked at the RFC, not much help. It's just like a uh, list, it lists things, the classic old RFCs. So we created a minimal FTP server to just talk to it. It's easy to insert our own exploit code. And if we just stuff a ton of, of uh, characters into there, we get a crash here and we get control over the program counter. If we want to execute code from there, we have a certain range of memory here. Uh, it loops back around, the red part is smashed before code execution ever happens and so we can't use this. Uh, B and D, we have labels for this actually. So execution clobbers the first 56 bytes, the program counters at PC. Those bytes wind up in the A5 register if we wanna use those. The stack pointer's pointing to F. And so we've got 197 bytes in F that we can use. We've got 100 or 260 or 204 left in A that we can use for our code. The stack moves around too much for us to reliably just point an address into there because it's dynamic. The, 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 it can load it different every time. 
And so we want to do code reuse. We want to find somewhere in memory we can jump to where it actually will uh, uh, find somewhere in memory that we can jump to and actually uh, uh, get reliable code execution. So there's lots of promising things that we went through and I'm going to have to kind of go through this part quickly and everything. The cheat code for this is uh, the, there's some libraries loaded early in the booting process that are almost always in the same place. And there's some code there where we can, uh, we can jump to uh, the stack pointer. So we can set the, essentially set the instruction pointer to the stack pointer by doing a jump SP. It's a two byte sequence and you're like, oh man, two bytes, I can find that easy in memory. Well, there's not a lot of memory, right? This is a very tight operating system and there's none of them in the ROMs. Uh, but there's one that's almost always in the same place in RAM. We write a payload for it. The payload is split across those code regions. There's just the, since code region one, the bottom part there is where code execution starts. I use that as sort of a trampoline. I just sort of uh, move the stack pointer and then uh, jump over into the other part of code and or I use it with a jump subroutine so that the next address is pushed to the stack and I use that as a reference for my strings that I need. And what I'm doing is I'm simply just writing a file to disk. Uh, reusing some of the I.O. handles is a little complicated on Amiga, so the most I the easiest shell code is simply to uh, write a file to disk. And this calls the Amiga APIs to do so. And this is a little more detailed look at that. And at the end, it will crash the entire system if you don't set up the stack back right and keep executing. And so to avoid crashing, I just sleep forever. <laughs> just, just call sleep and just let it sit there and grab a cycle every once in a while. Uh, running it, basically we connect up to a local FTP server with the payload. It loads up, tries to load up a directory with it, creates the file. Simple as that. So we get execution. We get the ability to drop a file anywhere on Amiga, which actually would be a pretty good, uh, pretty good plan if you wanted to establish uh, persistence. So with modern systems making teaching and learning memory corruption much more difficult, complex architectures, lots of mitigations, these systems, they can make it easier for you to sort of tinker around with the internals of something and get a feel for it before you're going to do it on a, on a, a more modern system. And so uh, it's easy, the, the, you can't completely understand Windows. No one person can understand everything in Windows. You could sit down and over time reverse engineer every single piece of an Amigo, of Amigo OS and have a complete understanding of this system. And that's a good feeling to have and it's a nice little um, hobby approach type thing if you like that sort of thing. We can take advantage of this to find hidden things in, in software. We can uh, uh, look inside of old software for hidden features, hidden functionality that's been disabled. There's a site called The Cutting Room Floor that does this for video games and there's all sorts of sprites and levels and music and things like that in games that have been lost to time. Uh, embedded systems have similar architectures to these simpler architectures and so this is a good kind of springboard into getting into embedded systems as well. And ultimately, the reason for doing this is just fun, right? Uh, if this sort of thing interests you, then it's interesting to do just for its own sake. And really, that's why a lot of us are in, in retro computing, uh, is it's nostalgic and it's just fun to play around with, to play around with something that's not Windows or Linux for a while. So thank you for your time on this. I appreciate you getting up early on a Sunday to, to check this out. This is my contact information, and, and I see a lot of y'all who, who clearly are Amiga users of, of a certain age. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, that have t-shirts and everything. And so I really appreciate folks that, that like this kind of hardware and software coming to attend this and, and seeing what, what I had to do with it. So thank you very much.